might make, you might notice a little smile on my face. You might notice a little dance in my step. Yes. 
and bless them with the tithes and offering, Father God. We pray that we be used the way you see fit. We love you. We give you the glory. We give you the praise. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, Calvary. It is good to be in the house of the Lord on this morning and to just come before his throne and in his presence to pray. Because we all know that prayer changes things, it changes your situation. Amen. Amen. And I don't know about you, but I had a lot to be thankful for on this morning. We are definitely glad to see Miss Mary Brown here. Right now, we ask that you just be a lift of our heads right 
on Heavenly Father, because we know when we completely give our will over to you, oh God, and submit to your will, we know that our lives are so much better for it, oh God. So God, we just ask, oh God, that you just, Lord, be with us, oh God, be our peace, Lord, be our shelter, be our refuge, oh God, be our strong tower right now, oh God. Lord, we just ask you to fix it right now, oh God, whatever it is that needs to be fixed, we just ask you to fix it right now in the name of Jesus. And Lord, right now, oh God, we just ask that you just go throughout the hospital rooms, oh God, and Lord, we just ask, oh God, that you just touch, Lord, everybody that's in the hospital, oh God, and I thank you right now for the good work you're doing in my mother, oh God, and I just ask that you just continue to be with her and grant her peace and strength, oh God. And then, Heavenly Father, Lord, I ask that you be with those in Haiti and Mexico who are affected by the earthquake, Heavenly Father, and other things that are going on. And then I ask, oh God, that you dispatch your angels over to Afghanistan where the Taliban is rising up again, Heavenly Father. And then I ask you, Lord, to dispatch angels over in Washington, D.C., oh God. Lord, where it just seems to continue to be political strife, oh God. And so, Lord, we just ask. Your people, oh God. Lord, I ask, oh God, that you impart a word. 
prayers. Thank God for your presence and we greet those who are worshiping with us this morning. I believe on Facebook Live virtually, those who are logged into our Facebook page, we greet you this morning. In the name of Jesus, I want to say it's good to see you all. You look good. And I thank you so much for your prayers while I was away. As you know, I want to thank you for your prayers. As you know that while I was away, our family lost the patriarch. This morning, after a break, we continue our sermon series on the pastoral epistles. And so far, we have covered 1 Timothy 1, 3 through 7, and 1 Timothy 1, 18 through 20 on July the 11th and July 18th. 
19th, respectively, and they are available to you on the Calvary Baptist Church of Milwaukee YouTube channel. As I said earlier, we greet those of you who are live with us this moment today, and we appreciate your presence with us virtually on Facebook Live. Thank you to the Reverend Dr. Eleanor Cardenas, Reverend Michelle Peterson, and Reverend Howard Brown for allowing God to use all of you always and specifically over these past weeks. I would wish you would turn in your Bibles to 1 Timothy 1.18, 1 Timothy 1.18, and that you would also look at, should be, I'm not sure if it's on the screen, but also we're going to read verses 9 through 15 of the second chapter. So yes, 1 Timothy 1, 18 through 20. And then we're going to read, pick it up in the second chapter, 9 through uh, 15. And what we find in the middle is our focal text. And so let us look to, to the scripture at this time. I'm reading out of the New Revised Standard Version and as and encourage you to read whatever version you have on your Bible app, uh, on your phone, on your tablet, and stay with the scripture open if you are able to throughout this sermon. The Word of God reads as follows. I'm giving you these instructions, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies made earlier about you, so that by following them you may fight the good fight, having faith and a good conscience. By rejecting conscience, certain persons have suffered shipwreck in the faith. Among them are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have turned over to Satan, so that they may learn not to blaspheme. And then we want to pick up in the ninth verse of that second chapter where it says, yes, where it says, also that the women should dress themselves modestly and decently in suitable clothing, not with their hair braided or with gold pearls or expensive clothes, but with good works as is proper for women who profess reverence for God. Let a woman learn in silence with full submission. I permit no woman to teach or to have authority over a man. She is to keep silent. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing, provided they continue in faith and love and holiness with modesty. And then our focal passage for today is uh, beginning in that first verse of the second chapter. First of all then, I heard that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for everyone, for kings and all who are in high positions, so that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and dignity. This is right and is acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, there is also one mediator between God and humankind, Christ Jesus himself human, who gave himself a ransom for all. This was attested at the right time. For this I was appointed a hero and an apostle. I am telling the truth. I am not lying. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or argument. May God add a blessing to the reading and the hearing, the understanding and the application of his holy word. Amen. You may go to your seats in the presence of God. I want to preach as God shall guide from the 
subject, position yourself to win. Position yourself to win. These sermons are specifically intended, as I told you at the outset of this series, for pastors and the people who allow themselves to be pastored in local churches. Just as family units are the primary building blocks of the local church, local churches are the primary building blocks for the kingdom of God in cities, states, the United States, and the world. It is my contention that Jesus provided the mission for the church in the Great Commission. Our vision is rebuilding families scripturally based on the story of Joseph and how God used him to save the nation of Israel. Our vision is the car driving to the fulfillment of the mission. Our vision is achieved as we engage in preaching, teaching, pastoral care, fellowship, and service. So we have mission, we have vision, and we have the goal supporting the vision to achieve the mission. The vision is given to the pastor and enough people in that place, if God sent the pastor, will bear witness to the vision. No local church can be all things to all people, even though many have tried. There are church families for everyone, and it is God who knows best. The shepherd is Jesus. Submission to the shepherd results in being shown the pastoral leadership one is to submit to. The pastor is not off the hook. The pastor is where they are by assignment. It is a peculiar calling. Whatever our life calling is, whatever God put us on earth to be and to do, we should want to win at it. Tim S. Grover is the man who, beginning in 1989, became Michael Jordan's personal trainer. When Jordan retired from basketball the final time, Grover was hired by the late Kobe Bryant. His latest book is called Winning, The Unforgiving Race to Greatness. Since I bought it on Audible not two weeks ago, I have not been able to cut my phone off from listening to it. I have already completed it twice and will likely listen to it again in the very foreseeable future. As a matter of fact, probably tonight, whenever I leave here, I'll go and start listening to it again. Not everybody has the desire to win. Some are always content to be at the middle of the pack. And if that is what they want, fine. Time won't permit us to go into all the reasons people decide uh, to become, uh, to become, not to become great and decide not to win. But some don't even know what to think about what I just said. Some come from an environment of winning, but others have to create the environment of winning. Let me just pause right here and say, some people came from that. They came from that. Their families had money or what have you, had privilege, etc. But if you want to win, and you were born, we can't control the situations that we were born into, but we can control how we live our life. We can't go back, but we can go forward. And so if you were not born into a winning situation, if you were not born with a silver spoon in your mouth, if you were not born where everything was set up to help you succeed, you, by the power of God, if you want it bad enough, can create the environment to win in your own life. In the cases of Jordan and Kobe, they obviously had their own staff coaches. Get this, y'all. Their own staff coaches because they played on a team. I mean, if you know that the Bulls and the Lakers had team trainers, but they were such Deacon Ryan, and I know because you're a baller, they were such serious competitors that they hired the best trainer in addition to what they already had because they know that if you want to rise above the pack, you cannot do what the pack is doing. You have to do something different. Paul was a winner. And Paul wanted Timothy. I believe there's some winners in this room today. I believe there's some winners in this sanctuary today. I believe there's some competitors in here today that want to win and are not going to sit down and let life beat you. You're going to stand up and by the power of God, you're going
going to win in Jesus' name. You're going to put in the work. You're going to put in the energy. Paul was a winner. And Paul wanted Timothy to be a winner. Paul wrote most of the New Testament. A great preacher and theologian, the greatest public intellectual of that particular time. And he wanted his son in the ministry, Timothy, to win. In this case, it wasn't basketball games, but the same tenacity one needs to win games on a court or a field is very akin to the tenacity one needs to win spiritual battles, especially if you are going to last as pastor in a local church. This applies to those who hold up the pastor's arm because the pastor doesn't stay there by himself. It applies, this applies to those who hold up the pastor's arms in prayer and practice. When I say prayer and practice, I mean privately and publicly. Some folk is not ashamed to speak up for the pastor when there's people around. Groma said, there were some NBA players who wanted to join Kobe in what he was doing. And he didn't give any names in the book, but he said they didn't return after the first workout. They didn't want it bad enough. But Paul wanted Timothy to be a winner. Is there somebody here who understands? You think you understand where I might be going in this sermon today? Paul wanted Timothy to be a winner. In the material preceding our focal text, we see that this is true. In 1 Timothy 1, 18 through 20, which we read, Paul reminds Timothy that what God wants from him as a preacher pastor over this flock in Ephesus is in him. Somebody say, it's in me. Yeah. It's in me, dude. You, you got to believe, you got to believe that winning is in you. He wanted Timothy to understand that winning was in him. Paul mentions the prophecies that were spoken regarding. I'm excited, y'all. I can't help it because I'm preaching my life because I am a winner. I've had some situations where I've had to create and had to turn and had to do some crazy stuff, but I'm a winner down deep in my soul. I'm a good man, and you can't keep a good man. Whenever I preach that, this is. 
material is our material for today. It is found in 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 8. And, that, and my thesis is that Paul, being a winner himself, wanted Timothy to become a winner as well. Let's go into the text. First of all, y'all pray for my sinuses and my nose trying to act up on me, but I'm going to preach anyway. First of all, y'all remember whenever I was younger, my nose would run all through the sermon. Amen. Some of y'all were here 20 years ago, 19, 18, 20 years ago. Y'all remember that. Amen. And y'all trying to help me. I don't know what's going on today. I may be aging backwards. I don't know. But anyway, <laughs> in verses 1 through 2, first of all then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for everyone, for kings and all who are in high positions so that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and dignity. Stop right there. One can only win in their personal life, their family life, church life, and professional life if they pray. This is about prayer right here. This is instruction regarding prayer. Amen? Amen. The rationale for prayer in this particular way that we see in the text Scholar and theologian Margaret Mitchell reminds us is strategic as we look at two and two for kings and all who are in high positions that we may, okay, y'all see this, that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all God. So this particular prayer that Paul is telling Timothy to model and to lead the congregation in is strategic. But it is also theological. And the theological basis and the, 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 the foundation is found in verses 3 through 7. All right? This is right and is acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God. There is also one mediator between God and humankind, Christ Jesus himself human, who gave himself a ransom for all. This was attested at the right time. For this, I was appointed a herald and an apostle. I am telling the truth. I am not lying. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and in truth. Since 129 before the Christian era, Ephesus had been under Roman rule. Christianity emerged during the Roman Empire and as such only exercised freedom under Roman authority. <clears throat> that is why Paul told Timothy to lead the people to pray that way so that the church could be preserved. If we listen to the Holy Spirit. I need some of y'all to pray for my voice. If we listen to the Holy Spirit, He will direct us based in Scripture. He will direct us based in theological soundness to be strategic. In order to reveal what Satan has destroyed, there must be theological soundness and Holy Spirit providing strategy. We're rebuilding people, rebuilding families. But it's one thing to say, but it's another thing to do. In order for that to happen, in order to reveal what Satan has stolen, <clears throat> what Satan has destroyed, there has to be Holy Spirit provided strategy with that theological soundness. The Holy Spirit living on the inside of us is our secret weapon and the relationship with him is nourished through obedience to him. Is there somebody here today that knows that you cannot nourish a relationship with the Holy Spirit without being obedient to him? A pitfall of many Christians is to over-spiritualize. Please say over-spiritualize. This is why one has to know Jesus for themselves. 
spiritualizing and relying on God to do what God has given us ability and resources to do is laziness. President Obama would never have been president if he hadn't had a mother who got him up before daylight to get his lesson. Kobe would never have been Kobe without him being humble enough to call Michael Jordan and ask questions and then doing what Michael Jordan and Tim Grover were asking him to do in his training. Jordan would never have been Jordan without working his behind off and being the first superstar to hire someone like Tim Grover so he could separate himself from the rest of the pack. God gave manna to Israel in the Old Testament, but in Joshua 5 and 12, it says that the manna stopped and they ate the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. In other words, the manna did not always continue. And then in the second point, in verses 3 through 7, which I just finished reading, Paul further explains here why Timothy should be an example of good prayer and so instruct the flock that he is over. Verse 3 says, if you're looking at your text, verse 3 says, it is the right thing to do. Help, thank you, Holy Spirit. Verse 4 says, God desires everybody to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. This, by the way, is why discipleship is key for a healthy church. People get saved because the Holy Spirit draws them. When we accept Christ, the Holy Spirit comes immediately to live inside of us. But we must cultivate the relationship with Him. As we do, we come more and more into the knowledge of the truth so that we can live by it and be Christ's lights in the world. Then preachers, those of you who are sitting with me on the pulpit, here is some more of that shouting material that I mentioned from an earlier passage in 1 Timothy. Paul is preaching here. Whenever you read these verses, you can you can hear a sermon. You can hear Paul preaching with his pen. And this is just like for me. I, how many of you like watermelon? I like watermelon. And when I read this passage and read it over and over again, this is the succulent and fresh watermelon cut wide open. It is the sweet taste of our Redeemer Jesus Christ saving us. That is why David said, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man or woman who trusts in him. Y'all can help me preach this today. I need some help. Thank you for praying. Keep on praying because I'm determined to win. Paul even tells his son, he says, I'm a herald uh, of the gospel. Uh, in other words, uh, Paul is saying, uh, so much uh, that I scream and holler his name. Uh, I'm a herald uh, of the gospel uh, and he died uh, on Calvary. Uh, these verses uh, are the gospel uh, and the gospel uh, is the foundation to me. Uh, on Christ, uh, the Son of God, uh, I stand uh, on the ground and uh, seek and say, Let me get up. 